Let me welcome everyone who's just recently logged on and welcome to Precision Digital's presentation about the new features and approvals on the Consolidator Plus multivariable controller. Start off with allow me to introduce myself. My name is Joe Ryan. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing at Precision Digital. I've been in this industry for, I know it says 15 here, but almost 20 years come January, uh, doing everything from product design for these kinds of instruments to work out in the field, uh, working with resellers who are, are packaging this up into total solutions for their customers. Uh, so I've got a pretty good pool of experience to draw on to talk about what you might use a product like this for and how these new features are going to benefit you. The goal today is first going to be to look at a quick overview of the PD9000 PD Consolidator Plus controller and talk about what it is. Then we're going to talk about the new features that it has and then talk about a little more in-depth explanation of the PID control and HOA operation features, really explain what those are and how they can benefit you. And we're going to do that by taking a look at some real simple block diagram application layouts so you'll hopefully understand how those loops work and how those switches might benefit you. So with that, I'm going to take myself off camera so you can focus on the slides themselves. However, I am going to ask you to answer a poll question that I'm about to launch for you because I'd like to know how familiar you are with the Consolidator Plus. Is this something that you've seen a lot of, you've tried to spec some, maybe you've used it before, or is this something that you're just kind of now hearing about and you'd really like to learn a lot more about it in the future? This will help me shape the next few presentation slides so that we cover just enough of the Consolidator Plus general overview to be valuable without turning this whole half hour into a talk about something you may already know. And interestingly, it, it looks like the vast majority of you here are saying that you know, you've seen it before, you've seen it in presentations, you've seen literature on it, uh, but not a lot of you are real familiar with it. We consider yourselves to be experts, uh, but at the same time, not many of you have never heard of it, which is expected given that you showed up here today. So I thank you for that feedback. We'll adjust the presentation accordingly to perhaps talk a little bit more about the product in general than I might otherwise have done. So let's get started with a quick overview of the Consolidator Plus. And I really don't want to overlook this first bullet. Certainly you're going to go ahead and read all of these lines, but let me talk about this first line for a minute. The Consolidator Plus is a NEMA 4X panel mount multi-channel controller for process display alarm and control applications. Well, let's really talk about what that means. This is a NEMA 4X, which means it's a uh, panel mount product that goes inside of a panel or inside of a uh, enclosure door. But when it is installed through that door, it is a NEMA 4X seal, meaning that it is a waterproof, it is a dust tight seal. It's a multi-channel controller. So we don't just take in one 4 to 20 milliamp signal and display it. We take in a whole bunch of 4 to 20 milliamp inputs. We have a whole bunch of outputs, a whole bunch of relays, and use those interacting with each other to get not just display, but alarm and control applications done as well. So this is a panel mount device that goes in the door of a product, uh, the door of an enclosure, rather, or the door of a control cabinet or on a control panel. Seals to it, so it's washed down safe. Uh, you can splash it, you can put it outdoors, etc. And you're going to get a lot of I.O. through this product that you can then do fancy things with. You know, have, have them switch between which inputs or controlling which outputs or average signals. You can do PID loops. Many things that traditionally you might need a, a uh, PLC or an HMI to do, you can do on your Consolidator Plus. And of course, it accepts 4 to 20 million inputs, flow meter pulse inputs, digital inputs, and it is a Modbus device. It can be a master, a slave, or a packet sniffer, which we call a snooper. It's got a great looking display on it, lots of relay analog and digital output possibilities, Ethernet for Modbus capabilities as well, which is really great if you're integrating this into an existing data system. All sorts of timer capabilities, which come in pretty handy if you want to, for example, know how long a loading process took or time how long some, some alarm is going to be on for, have something happen at a regular scheduled basis, et cetera. And all of that is programmed via free Consolidator Plus configuration software. This is not a PLC. You don't buy software to access it and then write a bunch of code. You 
you configure it with drop down menus and clickable checkboxes. You type in names into fields and say, okay, this is the channel one name. What do you want to call it? There's no programming here. There's no ladder logic here to do. Now, specifically today, we're going to talk about the fact that we now have UL and CUL listing for hazardous and ordinary locations. And we'll get into what that means in a bit. We've got auto tuning PID control for multiple control loops. We certainly, Precision Digital makes a line of PID controllers, but those are all single loop controllers. If you want to bring all those loops into one device, Consolid Air can do that. And we now support switching so you can easily have it be your HOA switch to control your pumps thanks to our two, three, and four-way internal switching functions. And finally, though uh, it's not a, a true feature, let's call it, you do now need to specify AC or DC power. So now the part numbers have been adjusted, so you have to pick AC or DC power, and that's a result of doing what we need to do to get that UL and CUL listing. To give you an idea of what the consolidator looks like on the back, this is what a rear picture of the consolidator plus looks like. Here's your gasket that would seal to your panel. So sticking through the back of the panel, you would just have this inner rectangle area here. And when you look there, this is an example that's fully populated with all sorts of different IOs. So you can see that we've got pulse inputs on this model, analog inputs. Each analog input has three terminals on it because each analog input and each analog output have their own isolated 24 volt power supply. So every analog input or output has its own isolated power supply to run the transmitter or the 4 to 20 milliamp output loop. That's a great feature. They cannot drive home the importance of enough. So if you're going to connect up four level transmitters to this product, you're going to have four power supplies to run them. It's a great feature that saves lots of time and hassle trying to figure out how you're going to power these loops. You have to worry about isolation. You don't have to worry about any of those questions because we provide you the power supply on everything analog here. Speaking of which, there are also analog outputs and relays. And you'll notice that you get five relays per card, five analog outputs per card, four inputs per pulse or analog input card. And you can populate these however you'd like. We do like you to build the part number when you order, so we send it out all built up and constructed. But you can add cards later in the field if you wish. So for example, this pulse input card was added later, you might be able to see there's a bit of a square there on the back overlay because we send out that overlay with the new card. So if you had to change that out or replace in the field, you could do it. It's a little bit of a hassle with a bunch of screws and the configuration on the front you have to do, but it can be done. We'd just rather do it here and have you order to the Consolidator Plus altogether if you know what you need in advance. Over on the right, you've got your four digital inputs, which are standard, your five digital outputs, which are standard, your RS-485 connection for Modbus, which is standard. Uh, your micro USB for programming, which is standard. And in this case, we've got your AC or high voltage input. The DC input would actually appear right over here. We've added the Ethernet option for Modbus TCP IP. And one thing you don't see here is we go right here, which is the USB port that connects up to a USB stick for data logging. And it'll log right onto that USB stick. The 5.7 inch color display lets you show some really great graphics that get a lot of data across the users in a very intuitive way. Starting with the screen in the upper left, you get a real good sense of what you can do. Using tanks, just as a simple example for this, you can see that every channel has its own name, its own units. Because we have a, a totally graphical display, we can add commas easily to the numbers, have however many decimal points you'd like. And with just a click of a push, uh, click of a checkbox in the program, you can turn on the bar graphs for all these channels. And those bar graphs even bring with them the alarm points, and that's what those horizontal lines are. You can see you have all sorts of different color options to make things make sense. Maybe you want your water in blue, your oil in black. Maybe you want to have each tank have its own color, so it's very easy to connect up tank one here to the numbers over here. And one of my favorite features of the Consolidator is that not only can I select what I want to have on the screen, but it will very easily resize and reorient the display to fit all the information you want. If I have a display like this one in the upper left, and I just go in and uncheck the checkbox that says Show Bar Graph, it automatically sets the display up like this one below it. It can automatically take those bar graphs away 
and resize all my channels I have on this screen to show appropriately on there. I don't have to set it up to the level of detail and hassle you have to do to get like an HMI to show the same information. Huge time saver in that regard. To configure it, you just connect up the Consolidator Plus to your laptop with a standard micro USB cable. Software is free to download, and as I said, there's no programming. So you just get the software, you own your, your setup, unlike many PLC codes. Uh, and if you want to go in and make a change, change your set point, to add a channel, I bet your operators and your technicians can learn to do that. It's not as challenging as trying to access some PLC to do so. So it's a nice way to take back control of processes that need a little bit more than what your standard panel meter can do but that you really don't want to get into the whole PLC HMI world in order to solve. If you don't already have an existing panel, we offer both steel and plastic enclosures. The steel ones are NEMA 4, steel technically rust, so though it is pretty rugged, it's a NEMA 4 product, and that X means that it's corrosion resistant, so the plastic is NEMA 4X, the stainless steel, I'm sorry, the steel is uh, NEMA 4, but they're both that waterproof, dust tight, outdoor weatherable rated NEMA 4. We've got a variety of different sizes. They come with the 10 inch by 10 inch cutout already in them to drop the consolidator into. And they're just generally nice boxes. They come with easy ways to mount them, hinges in the doors. We've even got a version of it with a fully clear plastic cover that sits over the consolidator if you want to lock out the ability of folks to touch the button. There's a password. I, here it is. I know someone's going to ask about that. There is a password. Thank you, John, for asking. Uh, however, if you do want to lock somebody out, we offer a, uh, a totally sealed version of this with a, a loop there that you can add a lock to. So let's dive into what the new features are on the Consolidator Plus. That's, after all, what we're here to talk about. And let's begin with UL and CUL. So diving into what that means. So you will now see this UL mark on the side of the consolidator and on the label. It means that it is both U.S. and Canadian listed. So that's what the UL and CUL means. UL is for Underwriters Laboratories, and CUL is the Canadian version of Underwriters Laboratories. And it is a UL listed product. It's UL listed for both hazardous area locations, where it carries Class 1 Div 2 approvals, and for ordinary locations where it's UL 508. The really nice part about those, those specific approvals is that because it is UL 508 for industrial control equipment, it has passed this whole series of tests, which means that a UL listed panel shop or a UL listed skid can have this installed on there and it brings its UL approvals with it. They don't have to get the UL inspector to okay the use of the product because it is already a UL listed complete product. Another nice thing about being UL listed for 508 is they've given us their UL Type 4X rating. That's essentially the same dust tight, water tight, corrosion resistant approvals you get from NEMA 4X, but UL has gone ahead and approved it, and so they call it a UL Type 4X approval. But it means you don't just have to trust us that it's going to be good for outdoor use. It's got all those NEMA 4X, or in this case, UL Type 4X uh, water resistance characteristics that has been tested by UL, a third party, to confirm. As far as hazardous areas go, this is a Class 1 Div 2 product, or Class one, or class 2 Div 2 or Class 3. Um, that means it's used for all of the types of combustible material you may have, whether it's flammable vapors, dusts, fibers. We've got an approval that covers it. And we are Division 2. So to talk about that for a brief moment, what the advantages of that is this. Many transmitters out there are going to be division one. Let's imagine for a moment that, again, just sticking with level as a simple application, I've got a tank and I have a, a transmitter that's going to be installed in that tank. Well, if that's, uh, let's call it a guided wave radar transmitter, right? It's going to be installed through that tank wall and it's going to be exposed to all the hazards that are literally in the tank all the time with the hazardous material. That is then going to go out to your consolidator plus. Well, you're going to need a barrier to go through that 
because you're going to be passing from the area where the material, the hazard, is always present. And that's going to be your Division I area. And you're going to be passing into your Division II area where the hazard is only present under abnormal conditions. You can imagine inside the tank, if this is, let's say, storing diesel fuel, you're always going to have that diesel fuel in those fumes. Outside that tank, you're only going to have those if there's a spill, someone leaves a valve open, they open a door or a hatch. It shouldn't normally just be washed up in diesel fuel. Um, it's up to your facility how you rate your various areas, and everyone does it differently. But most likely there's an area very close to the tank nearby where you can put a display like this that's considered a Division II area. Why you do that is because to cross from that Div 1 to Div 2 area, I'm going to need to install a barrier on that transmitter. I'll put E for barrier here. I know my drawing is, is expert level. I thank you for the, the tons of comments I'm sure you are typing in to tell me how great my drawing is, but bear with me here. And so now I need a barrier to go out to my transmitter. There's nothing the consolidator can do about that. It's required as part of the control drawings of the Div 1 transmitter. But because the consolidator is Div 2, when I then decide to send a bunch of wires out to my control room, bringing back 4 to 20s, or I want to send them out to a piece of telemetry equipment. So, you know, over here I've got my control room panels or my control room TV showing me my process. Uh, maybe this wire is going to go out to a wireless telemetry auto dialer sort of situation. Um, I might also want to be sending some of this to some kind of uh, remote data logger or chart recorder, or maybe I've got a PLC out here that's controlling other processes that want feedback from the consolidator. When I do that, or even when I just need to power up the consolidator, and I want to bring in my 120 volts. I don't need a barrier to go from the safe area to that Division II area because the consolidator has full Division II approval. So it's a big benefit to use a product that has that Division II approval when it's a display and control product like this, as opposed to just being a Division I product, which will always require barriers to go anywhere. So the long story short of it is, now that we have CUL and UL listing for hazardous areas, you can install us in your Division II area in Canada and the U.S., and it's going to be pretty easy to do so because you're only going to need barriers when you're sending the wires out to the transmitters. You also now have to specify AC or DC power. Your AC power goes in the lower right. If you get DC power, it goes in the upper right. It has all the same features either way. The only difference is the DC power supply is going to be a slight cost adder on the product, and you have to choose which one you want. So when you're going to purchase one of these or specify it, make sure you know what your intention is to power it. You get all of the 24-volt isolated power supplies regardless. There's no, no feature changes. There's no spec changes from one to the other. It's just a question of how you want to power the product. Now let's get into the actual... Uh, software features, the things you can do now with the product that aren't sort of those hardware or approval related items. What can you do with PID control? You know, if you're not familiar with that, why, why would you care about this? Well, PID control for starters is used to control a temperature or a process level. Um, I say level there meaning the, the, the level of the process. That could be an actual level or it could be a flow rate. It could be a uh, amount of pressure, it could be a temperature, uh, it could be a percentage of, of speed, uh, it could be a bunch of different things, but you want to control the intensity of that process to a specific number. A great way to explain it is the thermostat in your house is most likely on-off control. It, you set it to 72, and you know it turns on the heater when you get down to 70, and it turns off the heater when you get up to 74, and so you just fluctuate the temperature all day long. If you really wanted to control it at 72 degrees, you'd have a PID control system in your house that would control your, let's say, baseboard heat at 60% in the winter. And it would just be on at 60% all the time, and that would keep your house at exactly 72 degrees. And it has all the algorithms and intelligence needed to know, okay, well, it's getting colder at night. We better crank it up to 68%. Or, oh, it's a nice sunny day. We better dial it back to 48%. And it would always keep your temperature right at 72 degrees. To those of you who are a little bit more familiar with PID control, what can we do with it? Well, 
We've got 4 to 20 milliamp outputs, often called SCR or SCR control, and that stands for silicon controlled rectifier. That that's a term used because a lot of the time PID controller 4 to 20 milliamp outputs go to power controllers that use SCR controls. However, that 4 to 20 milliamp output could be, for example, controlling a valve position. If you're using it for cooling, and it decides, well, we've got a valve actuator here, and to cool this process, we need it to be 40% on for this cold water. Great, 4 to 20 can do that for you. We also have the ability to pulse width modulation for SSR control or solid state relay control. That's for when you either want to use a digital output to quickly switch a, a, a solid state relay on and off, or you want to use a mechanical relay to switch an intermediate relay a little more slowly, uh, because you you want to, you only have the ability to do on and off control, but you want to do it fast enough that you're not having these big swings in your process variable. And we'll see an example of that in a bit. It'll do bidirectional control, or what's called heating and cooling, so it can both drive the process up and down with two different outputs connected to that one input. And thanks to our switch functions that we now have, you get some neat features in there, like the ability to quickly change some pre-programmed set points, to easily switch between auto and manual mode just by using some soft keys you can program down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and you can enter your new set points easily with that new set point soft key. So you want to change your set point, you just hit your set button and punch it in. Finally, auto-tuning is a breeze. When you're doing your initial setup, you can just add auto-tuning to a screen even, get your, get your configuration done mechanically, and then auto-tune it to a quote-unquote average set point, let's call it, that you might be using. Thanks to the ability to put almost anything on a screen, I could even make a screen, call it PID control one, show my process variable, show my set point, and show the power percentage on my outputs that are needed to drive my process variable to my set point. So you can see here, we're driving that 80 degrees process variable up to 90 degrees, and to do it, we're putting 60.5% on my output. Now that output could be a 4 to 20 that's going to a power controller. That output could be a relay that's just turning on a heating element. A lot of different things that output could, could be, but it's at 60% power. Here's a few other examples of how you might set things up. On the left, you've got a main PID control screen. That's designed to show you the average process variable, in this case we're actually taking in multiple temperature readings and averaging them across the vessel. And because we are just on power up, we have it set up to be in stop mode. So I can say, okay, I'm not actively controlling this right now. I have to actually start this if I want it to go. But I can also see my active set point. So the minute I do turn it on, obviously I'm going to start my cooling process to bring that PV down. Over on the right, we've set up four different set points, set point one, two, three, and four, so that we can choose between some commonly used set points in that application. And that way somebody doesn't have to remember what they are or rely on a post-it on the panel. You can just select which set point you're using for that process. Over on the left, you've got an example of a running PID control process. And again, you can add lots of different things onto these screens. These are just some example ones we set up. This time we're again showing that PV average, we're showing our active set point. But if we began that process and started it up, now you'd see that power. And it's gonna know, I need to go down pretty significantly in temperature here. So it's gonna set that power to minus 100%, which is the cool, minus being the cooling side of this process. And it's gonna crank up that cooling side in order to kick it on. If I were to hit my next arrow and go over to the following screen, we again see what that PV average is. But now we've got it, that screen set up to show you the levels of either pulse width modulated heat or pulse width modulated cooling that we're doing. And in this case, of course, we're cooling, right? So my heating output is off and my cooling output is on because my power levels are at minus 100%. I could, if I wanted to, put all of this information on one screen because you can have up to eight pieces of information on any given consolidator screen. We're just breaking it out like this to hopefully make it a little easier to understand. What might a simple PID application look like? Well, this would be one loop of your possible multiple loops going through the consolidator. Here, I'm trying to control the temperature 
inside of a vessel with an electric heating element. I have a temperature sensor installed inside there. It's called a thermocoupler or an RTD most likely. And I'm bringing that into a temperature transmitter. The consolidator only accepts 4 to 20 milliamp input. So I have to go through the temperature transmitter and get a 4 to 20 milliamp output. That's bringing the temperature into the consolidator plus. Now that I'm there, it does the math needed to control the temperature, and we're using a digital output to drive an intermediate solid state relay, which is going to be quickly, because this is digital outputs and solid state relays, I can switch very fast. I can switch once a second. And it's going to be switching that power on and off, <clears throat> excuse me, with a, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, uh, with a duty cycle that is going to have some percentage, right? If I'm 100% on, let's say I'm doing a 10-second cycle here. If I have a 100% on, I'm going to be on for 10 seconds. If I have a 10% power call, I'm going to be on for one of those 10 seconds. So it's going to cycle that to allow load power to get to the electric heating element so it can dial in exactly what power level is needed to keep that vessel at the correct temperature. If I wanted to do heating and cooling, it might look something like this. So here we are, we've got our vessel, our environmental chamber. This time we've got two temperature inputs going to two temperature transmitters. Now you might be asking, well, why do I need two temperature transmitters here? And the answer is you don't. However, sometimes you want to do an average across a vessel. Sometimes you may want to have a primary and a backup like we do here. And you can set up alarms in the consolidator and say, hey, look, if my primary fails and it, my reading goes wild, switch over and start using the backup temperature transmitter as a input into this PID process. But you're only going to be controlling your PID from one of these at a time unless you average them together into a single value. Now I've got two digital outputs, one for heating, one for cooling. Up here I've got my heating output. Down below I've got my cooling output. And one of those is, again, driving the solid-state relay that's switching my heating element. And one of those is driving a relay that's controlling my compressor. I can change the cycle times on those because I'm not going to want to turn my compressor on and off every second. So I might make the, the output driving the compressor every couple of minutes. It'll switch. You know, allow it to power up, get going, and then cool off after it shuts down so that I'm not burning out that compressor. But my heating element can be switched much, much faster. And that way it can add in you can turn on the compressor and you can cycle in uh, heat exchanger for cooling, or I can be driving it directly with a heating element if I need to be heating it. This is a slight variation on that last example. The main difference here is how we're controlling the heating element and how we're controlling the cooling element. Now we're giving an analog 4 to 20 milliamp output that's going to a power controller that's going to do real high speed modification of the AC load signal going to that heating element, and that's how we're going to control that heat. And we're doing a 4 to 20 milliamp output to a cold water valve actuator that's going to push cold water through a heat exchanger in the vessel, in the environmental chamber, rather, um, based on the position of the valve, which is controlled by the 0 to 100 percent of that 4 to 20. So at 12 milliamps, my valve would be 50 percent open, and that's how much it's going to get through. So lots of different ways you can configure the consolidator to control multiple types of PID control loops. We also have better HOA capability. That stands for hand off auto, very common phrase used with pumps. Hand means that you are basically forcing it on. I want this pump on. Off means you are doing the opposite. You're forcing the pump off. And auto means that you just want it to do whatever it should do in your pump process. So let's say I'm draining a sump. Well, auto means if my sump says turn on, turn on. If the sump level control, if a sump level transmitter says stay off, be off. Whereas the hand is always on, the off is always off. And most of the time that's done via big chunky switches on the outside of panels. But now you can do it right on the consolidator if you like. You can build a switch into the consolidator. So, for example, here we've got HOA pump one. A nice generic name there for the example. We've got a tank that we're trying to control the level in. And whenever that tank gets too high, we want to turn on a pump and have it drain that pump down. 
So we've got all sorts of other pump information we're displaying on the screen. We've got the runtime, we've got how many cycles, what its current status is. But now we want to know what is the status of this switch, or I'm sorry, what is the status of this pump? So we added a, a frame here to tell us what the auto state would be. So right now, it's telling you it wants this pump to be on. The auto control method would say, okay, turn on this pump and drain this tank. However, we've got our HOA switch in the off position. And if we want to change it, all I've got to do is push these soft keys down the bottom that say hand off auto. Now, again, I could add more pumps into this. I could have multiple pumps with multiple screens. Lots I could expand out on. But this is a, a fairly simple way to show you how you can set these up for HOA switch control if you don't want to have big chunky switches on the outside of your controller, if you'd rather do it on the Consolidator Plus. Again, all a HOA switch really does is provide us a wiper that either is in that hand always on, that off always off, or that auto control mode. So we're essentially automatically programmatically acting like a mechanical toggle switch that has three positions in it. You set these up by using our new digital switch function where you can have two-way, three-way, or four-way switches. And then you select what those positions do. And then you can give them names for how you want them to show up in those soft keys. So here we went to switches. Well, we had no switches, so we're making a new one. We're calling it HOA pump one, the three-way switch. And position one's going to put that pump into manual. Position two is going to put that pump into off. And position three is going to put it into auto mode. And we do that by making it so that when those actions are engaged, we either switch that pump into manual on, which manual would override the auto state. We put that pump into manual off or we just switch it back to automatic. Now there's plenty of other applications for these switches, but handoff auto is a simple one and one that many of you probably run into, so that's why we like to use that a lot. Here's some other examples in a, for a two-way or four-way switch. Uh, one of the applications we've had some success with is the ability to switch over from various sensors. You may want to manually control that, not just have it automatically happen in the case of a failure. So here we've got a two-way switch that is used just to switch between two RTDs. That's all you do. You switch between what we've labeled as sensor one and sensor two. So now you can have it set up so that your digital inputs or your push buttons on the front will allow you to select which input reading you're going to use. And then you feed the output of the switch, so to speak. You feed whichever one of these sensors is currently active into other functions of the consolidator, like, for example, PID control. And I could do that same thing if I wanted to with four RTDs just by making a four-way switch. And in this case, they put some position actions in place that every time they would select sensor one, two, three, or four, it would turn on the appropriate light, or all in the case of four. Um, I'm sorry, it doesn't turn on all in the case of four. In the case of four, it, uh, it goes back to automatic control for a relay, uh, which are controlling lights on the panel. Now, one of the questions that has already come up, and I'm going to handle a few other questions here in a second. I know we're, we're running a little over time here. Uh, it's about demos. Um, two of you have actually already asked about demonstration units for these products. Uh, the people who are asking are resellers of Precision Digital. Uh, they're reps or distributors who might want to use the Consolidator Plus. And we do have a demonstration unit. It looks a lot like this. It is actually something I can show you right here on the screen, if you'll bear with me here a moment. I'm going to switch my camera over to showing you my Consolidator Plus demo unit. It's a stand-up demo unit. It comes with mounting feet to keep it upright and a bracket we install on there that allows you to mount a light and horn on the top so you can see what the relays are doing and how you could install it. And because it is a freestanding demonstration unit, you don't have to worry about the fact that it's in a box. They can see what you get when you order just the Consolidator Plus. I have this showing all sorts of different control screens. Hopefully that's coming through clear. All sorts of different control screens to show you flow rates and totals, some gas detection examples, enunciator panels, uh, working, working as a five-zone bar graph replacement. 
Uh, even doing some Modbus poll displays to show you what it would look like if you were pulling information out of Modbus transmitters. You've also got easy access to the back, which shows you all the different ways you can construct a consolidator. Uh, there's your data logging slot, by the way, that I'd put my uh, USB data logger in. And just like you saw in the picture earlier, I've got my Ethernet connection, power, et cetera. And the seven different slots on the back that can be populated by various kinds of I.O. cards. So if you were interested in using the consolidator as a demonstration unit, we certainly have one of those demos available. And I'm happy to talk to you about pricing and availability on demo units if you want to reach out afterwards. So with that, I have a few other questions here that I'm going to take a moment to answer. Uh, if you leave the webinar and you do get that one question poll, I'd appreciate you just typing in what your thoughts are. I'd love to be able to read them. Normally, I'd, I'd give four or five questions on these surveys, and we'd see what the responses are. But we're just going open-ended here, and we're going to see what people have to say. Uh, with that, let's talk about a couple of different questions people have. So Tom is asking a question about the power supplies. Can the power and, and I'm going to rephrase your question a little bit, Tom. Uh, can the power supplies power two wire level transmitters only, or can they also power three and four wire transmitters, be they level or flow or pressure sensors that, that need a separate power supply entirely? So most of the time, you are going to be good to power your transmitter from the power supplies that are part of the analog input. The only time that they, because each one of these power supplies is a 24-volt power supply that can produce 200 milliamps of power for a total output from the entirety of all the power supplies in the consolidator plus of no more than 1,600 milliamp draw at a time. So normally you're going to be fine. The one time I've seen there be some significant issue there is with gas detection. Consolidator plus makes a great gas detection unit, but some gas detection, some of these fixed gas detection units, can draw upwards of half an amp. And that's going to be more than any one consolidator power supply can provide. So there your options would be either gang up multiple analog inputs just to power it and use multiple power supplies, or realistically it's just going to be easier to get a DIN rail mount power supply and put it in the back of the panel. Uh, Precision Digital offers a fairly low cost 1.5 amp power supply. So that way you can get all the power you're going to need for the gas detection units. But if all you're doing is, is low level pressure, uh, then you're going to be perfectly fine with the power supplies that we're going to have on there, even if they are going to be a three or a four wire. Uh, and you even have power left over to tap off of them if you need to, to run lights and horns and things like that. Uh, Steve is asking a question about lead lag or pump alternation being possible. So, yeah, that is absolutely possible. Uh, you can set up the multiple, the multiple relays on this to cycle either one or multiple groups for either lead lag or pump alternation, whichever one you prefer. Uh, pump alternation cycles between multiple pumps, alternating which one turns on first, whereas lead lag, I believe you usually start with one lead pump, and then lagging pumps will always turn on after that. So it all depends on how you want to set up your cycling. But you can absolutely do lead lag with this. In fact, I see, Steve, you've got a couple of questions here, so we'll just go through all of those. Uh, you're also saying barriers are not required from Class 1 Div 1 to Class 1 Div 2. EP conduit junction boxes with stealth steel off is the standard in the U.S. Okay, well, that is news to me. I'm not going to say it's not the case. I am certainly not a uh, hazardous area expert, nor am I qualified by any kind of uh, nationally recognized test lab to give that kind of information and advice out officially. So, uh, so if there's a way to go from class one to div two using EP conduit and junction boxes, that would be great. You know, seal off gets that done. Uh, my general understanding was that you have to use barriers when you look at the control drawings of the transmitters generally, but uh, if that's not the case, that's awesome to hear. I do know that we do still benefit from being in the class, I'm sorry, being in the Div 2 area and being a Div 2 product, because now you won't need barriers to go out into your safe areas to run back to your control room. Uh, oh, and you make a third note here that that's sort of the standard for international setups with barriers and the like. So. Uh, I think that what I think the issue here that might be, Steve, is I think it has to do with protection methods, if I had to guess. I, I'm talking about connecting up to an intrinsically safe transmitter, perhaps, and maybe if you're using an explosion proof protection method product, then you're talking about conduits and junction boxes and seals. So that, that's probably the confusion. I'm, I am probably talking more international because there's probably a lot more uh, IS transmitters, uh, whereas 
here, you, you know, it, again, comes back to protection method and how the various agencies require you to wire up those protection schemes. And let me pull up one slide here for uh, Colin, I believe it is. And let me see here. You're asking a question about the enclosures. And again, to paraphrase your question, it seems to be uh, we provide, Precision Digital provides enclosures with a 10 inch by 10 inch cutout for the consolidator plus. Your question is can we provide additional cutouts for conduits, lights, buttons, et cetera? And the answer to that question is yes and no. Uh, we are not a panel shop. We don't just generally do custom panel cuts and designs unless you have some quantity behind it. However, we do have what we call a modification we can do to this that will take any consolidator enclosure you want, put a light and horn on the top, we can add a push button to them, and give you our standard modification package. And we can do that for almost any of our panel meter or panel products that you put inside enclosures. So if you're looking for a light, a horn, a strobe, various colors, or a three-stack light, great. We can provide that light, and we can mount it on the box. Well, draw, cut the holes to put it in the box. But what you're going to get is a box with a consolidator, a box with the box, a box with light and horn in it, a box with a button, and then you're going to have an enclosure with cutouts for all of those. That specific setup will do for you. If you need seven cutouts on the bottom, they're various sizes, you want some kind of, you know, uh, uh, cable glands, but you know, those aren't, things aren't specified, you know, we don't do that kind of custom build work, but we will provide you with an entire system with a, a light horn strobe and push button on there, the cutout for the consolidator, and then all you have to do is drill your holes for your conduit entries. So we can do a little bit of that work for you, but we don't do all of it. Of course, all that changes if you're talking any kind of volume, then we're happy to discuss. And Greg, you recently, I'm sorry, Jim, you recently sent in a question saying analog outputs can be active or passive. And the answer to that is yes, that is totally correct. Uh, the analog outputs on the consolidator can be either active or passive inputs. So if you already have a, a powered output from your transmitter, then great, you'd connect up to our, our milliamp plus and our milliamp minus. If you need power for your transmitter, you connect up to our 24 volt pin and our milliamp minus. So it's just a matter of how you wire the consolidator. It can take either passive or active analog inputs. With that folks, we are at 2.45. And I, as I said at the start, I do wanna respect the time of everyone here. There's a couple of questions we did not respond to and I'll make sure that we get back to you with answers to those questions. Uh, when, you, when you leave, should you see the survey? I'd appreciate you just filling out that one question. And hopefully we see you at a future presentation because this one has been well worth your time. Reach out with any other questions you may have. Otherwise, I'll wish you all a great weekend. I know it's only Wednesday, but it's getting close. Uh, and hopefully in the coming weeks, you find some great opportunities to use the Consolidator Plus. Thank you very much. Talk to you all soon.